If you've been following me on other social media platforms, or if you're subscribed to the channel, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, then you probably already know that Bethesda invited me to their community celebration event in Amsterdam that kicked off their 15-month campaign of festivities to commemorate the 10th anniversary of ESO. There's also an in-game celebration event known as the Jubilee happening right now and until the 23rd of April. While I was in the land of Stroop Waffles, coffee shops that are not actually coffee shops, and bikes, oh, so many bikes, I I attended a special creator event that allowed me to spend a fair amount of time playtesting Gold Road, and I got to listen in on some insightful developer roundtable discussions. I also attended the ESO 10-year celebration event that was open to the public. There, I playtested Gold Road some more, I got to listen to a bunch of really interesting developer panels that shone some light on the inner workings of the game, I attended a couple of lore-friendly workshops, saw Abner Tharn, watched some knights get absolutely clapped on, and more. I'll publish a more personal vlog about my experience in Amsterdam very soon. What's that? <laughs> But this video will only focus on the game-related information and experiences that came from my trip, specifically information about Gold Road and the styling and scribing systems that will debut with the release of this new chapter. If that sounds interesting, then stick around. I've included timestamps in this video to partition all the different segments, and I'll be adding relevant information that the developers shared with us whenever it's pertinent to do so. We'll start things off with a brief overview of the actual Gold Road presentation that was live streamed on Twitch with additional commentary from the developers. Then I'll chat about my personal experience with Gold Road when I playtested it. And then we'll wrap things up with some final thoughts and interesting bits of information from the developers. Gold Road launches on June 3rd for PC and June 18th for Xbox and PlayStation. And the PTS will include Gold Road on the 15th of April, so we'll be able to test it out some more soon enough. In the meantime, you can check out the free prologue quest content that's already available in the game and get this neat Mirror More Mud Crab pet upon completing it. Alright, let's get right into it. We're going to start off with a brief summary of the Gold Road presentation that was streamed on Twitch in case you missed it or wanted a refresher. Gina Bruno, ESO's senior community manager, kicked the stream off by introducing the keynote presented by the studio head of ZeniMax Online Studios, Matt Firer. Matt quickly summarized some of the main points he made in a presentation he gave at the GDC in San Francisco called 10 Years in Tamriel, before sharing a 10th anniversary celebration roadmap for the game with the audience. We were then treated to a deep dive of the content that will debut with the upcoming chapter, Gold Road. This panel, hosted by Gina and dubbed Traveling Down the Gold Road, consisted of the developers discussing 10 things that they're excited about as the release of this new chapter draws near in honor of the 10 years of ESO. But first, the devs quickly brought everyone up to speed about the new features and contents that we can experience in Gold Road when it finally comes out. Ed Stark, ESO Zone Lead, stated that many of us will recognize the setting of this new chapter, The West Wield, as it's a classic environment in a beloved Elder Scrolls game, Oblivion. We'll be able to see the Colovian Imperials in their homeland, and there will be a major focus on the new Daedric Prince, Ithelia. ESO's art director, CJ Greb, talked some more about how amazing it was to be able to add to the Elder Scrolls pantheon of Daedric Princes with the creation of Ithelia. He talked about how the writers had a solid idea of what they envisioned for the prince and their allied forces, such as shattered shard motifs, and that Ithelia's realm was literally and figuratively shattered, which helped inspire and direct the art team. Mike Finnegan, ESO's lead encounter designer, added to this discussion by mentioning that this theme is really pervasive throughout the entire chapter. The new monsters, the new world event called Miramore Incursions, and even the new trial, Lucin Citadel, among other things, all adhere to this aforementioned theme of the shattering of glass. Kira Ross Schlitt, the project lead for scribing, quickly introduced the new scribing system. She shared that we're going to be getting 11 new customizable skills in Gold Road that we'll be able to make our own. Some of the intended uses of this system are to be able to fill gaps in our builds and allow us to roleplay better, among other things. But we'd get a much more comprehensive overview of this system later in the presentation. Gina then kicked off the segment about the 10 things that the developers were excited about as Gold Road approached. She asked Kira what her favorite thing about scribing was, to which Kira responded, the Soul Burst skill, a new grimoire in the Soul Magic skill line that can be obtained upon completing the scribing quest line. Kira explained how she loved the visual effects of this skill, and that it's a very flexible skill that can be augmented to really become our own. She then decided to rescind her answer and share that the thing that she was most excited about was a signature script called Class Mastery. Signature scripts allow you to apply unique effects to grimoires, 
stay with me here, a grimoire is the term used for the skills that we'll be able to augment by way of the scribing system, like Soulburst. Kira stated that, quote unquote, the class mastery script allows you to access passives and mechanics from your class on these new grimoires. So, because she mains an arcanist, when she puts the class mastery script on one of the grimoires used by her main character, her character will be able to generate crux through that skill, which is not an arcanist class skill. The way Kira augmented the soul burst ability was by giving the skill a pull focus, meaning it pulls all of the enemies in towards her, then she has her crux created by way of the class mastery script that she slapped on that grimoire, and lastly, she inflicts her enemies with minor breach as her affix. That's the third augment that you can apply to a grimoire. She uses her customized soul burst skill to set up a nice damage combo with the fate carver skill. She also teased the necromancer class script, if there are no corpses nearby when the grimoire that has the script is used, then it will create a corpse. But if there are already a ton of dead bodies littered all around you, then you'll get a buff that scales with the amount of corpses in the area. The Dragonite class script gives you a buff depending on how many enemies you're fighting. And Finn's favorite grimoire was the shield throw skill because of the high doinking uptime that it has. Gina asked how these scribe skills affect group content, like dungeons or trial runs. Finn mentioned that the goal from the start was that they did not want to add any vertical power to the game through this system. The devs don't want players to need to have all of the scribe skills on their hotbar to be the most effective in content. Instead, the devs wanted to add horizontal progression and utility to their class by way of this system. For example, maybe you have this class ability that you wish also had some other component to it. And that's where scribing comes in and provides that build flexibility. Ed Stark was asked what he was most excited about from the perspective of having been the zone lead for Gold Road, to which he answered, creating Athelia. He also revealed that she's a main character in the Gold Road story, so she undergoes development based on your own actions and what she does throughout the story. He also shared that we've seen some parts of Athelia's realm already. Hmm. CJ Grab was most excited about being able to work on an autumnal zone. As Finn put it, after 10 years, it is finally autumn in ESO. CJ went on to talk about how there are three notable biomes in the West Wheeled, and the team was able to do something radically different in each biome like the winding streets of Skingrad or the luscious jungles in the Dawnwood biome. Upon being prompted to talk about world events, Finn stated that their most successful world events are the ones that organically bring people together. He suggested that the Miramore incursions that will occur in the West Wheeled are a grand elevation of previous world events. They'll draw people in, but you'll also have to do a little bit of work in order to access the quote-unquote meat of the world event as he put it. Another thing that Ed Stark is excited for us to experience in this chapter is more lore about Wood Elves. Damn right, dude, about time. <laughs> if I wasn't such an anxious Andy, I would have totally hollered in the crowd when he said that. Ed implied that there is a tie-in between the Wood Elves and the Forgotten Prince, Ithelia. The Bosmer are in the West Wheels because of a peculiar event. This jungle that seemingly springs up overnight and swallows up a third of the West Wheeled is taken as a sign by the Bosmer to migrate to the area and settle there but their culture ends up clashing with the culture of the Colovian Imperials. I also absolutely loved it when CJ Greb mentioned that Bosmer follow this sort of cultural prohibition called the Green Pact, to which Ed interrupted to say, do they? Do all of them? <laughs> that was so cool to hear. I've always found it pretty cringe how, for many people, their understanding of Bosmer culture can be summed up by sentiments like, oh, yeah, uh, don't they follow the Green Pact? Or, uh, aren't they like cannibals or something? <laughs> You know, their entire identities feel like they're wrapped up in this concept, one that isn't even fully understood by many Tez fans. So to hear the zone lead challenge this was very refreshing, and I look forward to being able to experience a more unique and complex depiction of my favorite Elder Scrolls race. There will also be a bunch of returning characters in this chapter, such as Baragon, the brother of Aveli Sharp Arrow, who becomes a major resource for us as we play through the main story. Mizzic Thunderboots returns, so does Narciss Dren, and of course, so does every everyone's favorite vampire twink, Fenorian. As we embark on the scribing questline, we'll also encounter these beings of ancient magic known as luminary guardians, such as an Indric, a griffin, and a dragon. In our homeland, what are we gonna do? 
the seventh thing that the team was excited for us to experience was all of the new monsters. Finn mentioned that anytime the team has delved into new Daedric spaces, they have to devise new monsters that fit thematically with these new areas. One of the new monsters is called the Fractured Remnant, a strange three-legged amalgamation of crystal and glass that can attack from different angles. Another is known as the Shattered Shard, which will form crystal weapons that it will use to attack us. Some new creatures were also added to the realm of the West Weald, such as the Theraker, which has both feline and scorpion features. Finn then talked to us about the new trial, Lucin Citadel. He recalled all of the cool, iconic mechanics from older trials, such as the Sanctum of Phidia poison, or the infamous Mauve Lorcage twins mechanic that really tested our ability to distinguish left from right, which is a really difficult challenge for most gamers, apparently. And he stated that Lucin Citadel has equally cool mechanics that have not been seen before, in particular the final boss, and he made a big deal out of emphasizing his air quotes when he said, boss. The only clue that he gave us about one of those mechanics is, get ready to run. The story for this trial is that there is a power source in Lucin Citadel called the Arcane Knot that players are tasked to go and collect and then retrieve. That allowed the encounter designers the ability to use this concept as a means to come up with neat new ways to challenge the players. The rewards for the trial looked pretty damn sweet too. A new system known as Styling will also debut with Gold Road, where players who own the chapter will be able to change the appearance of some of their skills, 22 on launch to be exact. Kira shared that her favorite new style is the Amethyst version of Wall of Elements, which vibes with the color palette of her main character, which is an Arcanist. CJ's favorite was the new Meteor style that turns the original blue meteor into a red one. This panel was concluded with Gina's favorite thing about the upcoming chapter, and that was all of us, and how we'll be able to experience the new chapter soon enough. She mentioned that the developers love watching everyone's PTS livestreams, and they look forward to seeing everyone's impressions of the new content and the new systems. Alright, I'll wrap up this segment of the video by recapping the Scribing 101 video that was played on stream and at the event. I'll leave a link to it in the description as well. In this video, Kira describes Scribing as being a new system that focuses on roleplay and choice, that allows players to have more agency over their skills. There are 11 new customizable skills that will debut with Gold Road, and these skills are called Grimoires. These Grimoires can then be customized in three different ways. You can customize a Grimoire's focus script, which changes the main function of the skill. You can also change a Grimoire's signature script, which gives you access to unique and interesting effects. And lastly, you can change a Grimoire's affix script, which gives you access to the major and minor buff system that you may already be familiar with. In order to gain access to the scribing system, you will need to own a copy of Gold Road, and you'll have to interact with a variety of scribing quest givers located outside of the various mages guilds. Upon talking to the NPC known as Adept Ernard, you'll kick off the scribing questline. Eventually, you'll gain access to the scribing altar, located in the Scalarium, a location that you'll get familiar with as you advance in the scribing questline. At the scribing altar, you'll be able to see all of the different grimoires that you've unlocked. Kira already had all 11 of them unlocked, but she showed us her favorite one, Soul Burst. The base function of this grimoire makes your character unleash a powerful burst of energy from within themselves. You can then choose to customize the rest of the skill and what exactly it actually ends up doing yourself. After selecting the grimoire, you'll have access to all of the scripts that are relevant to this grimoire that you've unlocked. The focus scripts determine the main function of a skill, such as what damage type it will be or if it will be an allied focus ability. The focus scripts also determine how much the skill will cost and what resource it will use. Kira ultimately goes with the pull focus script. When she adds it to her soul burst grimoire, it updates the target type and the cost of the ability. The signature scripts can then be used to further customize your skills so that they complement the playstyle that you're looking for such as leaning into a strength or supporting a weakness in your build. For example, Kira mentioned that she doesn't run a lot of healing in her build, so she's tempted to take the healing signature script that provides a heal over time. But then she realizes that the focus script that she chose wouldn't really synergize well with this combination, since her focus script, a pull, would target and pull in enemies. Thus, her heal over time would only affect herself, and it would do nothing to all of the enemies that she just pulled in. So she decides to change her focus script to a healing one. Now, Soul Burst will no longer pull enemies in. Instead, when it's cast, it will heal her and her allies for a specified amount. And now her beneficial signature and affix scripts, like the healing signature script that she chose, will not just be applied to her. 
they'll be applied to her allies as well. When she chose her healing focus, some scripts became unavailable to use because they were not compatible with this focus script. They can still be used on that grimoire, but only with different focus scripts. The last thing Kira does to complete her skill is add the Expedition Affix script, which will grant her and her allies a boost to their movement speed. Now that she's content with her scribe skill, Kira will have to use three luminous inks, the crafting currency for scribing that can be obtained out in the world, to complete the scribing process. She states, the amount of ink charged is equal to the number of scripts that you've added to a given grimoire. So, because she's scribing this grimoire for the first time, she'll have to spend three inks. In the future, if she wanted to just change a single script, then it would only cost her one. She concluded her presentation by showing us a few other combinations of scribe skills and going over the class mastery signature scripts function as well, one that allows players to access mechanics and passives from our classes. Kira also mentioned that there will be over 4,000 combinations of grimoires and scripts coming with this scribing system. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about my impressions from playing the game for about a total of almost two hours. I played for 30 minutes at the public celebration events, but then I also played for about an hour and a half when I attended the hands-on creator playtest event the day before. I was only supposed to play for an hour there and then attend my roundtable discussion, but no one told me that it was time to go. <laughs> and I was so engrossed in the gameplay that I didn't even notice everyone get up around me to go to their roundtables. But hey, that's a testament to just how engaging the new stuff is, right? <laughs> I spent a fair amount of time taking a look at the grimoires and scripts that we'll get in Gold Road. Rather than meticulously describing each one in detail, allow me to send you over to this Reddit thread by Hyperioxys that has more details about most of the scribe skills. Do recall that, because we were playing on an old build, the way these skills work may be subject to change. I'll talk about some skills that stood out to me though. The most noteworthy one was the Trample Grimoire, where you summon your mount and it runs in a straight line of fairways in front of you. I saw that you could add some crowd control to this skill, so your mount could basically run enemies over and knock them back, which sounds like peak tomfoolery in PvP. Knockback is such a busted CC, so to have access to it through a skill like this that has a really impressive range makes me a little nervous. <laughs> it was a goofy and fun skill to use, but I wasn't a big fan of the cast time. It makes sense to have one though, otherwise the skill would just be too cracked. The bow grimoire, Vault, was also fun to use. If you've tried to use a bow as a front bar weapon in PvP, which is something I actually used to do on my Nightblade years ago, before they nuked on Draining Shot and made you have to choose between getting a heal or a CC from that skill then you know that one of the weaknesses of that playstyle is just how squishy it can be. Stamsorx can work around this weakness because they have access to the class skill Streak, which allows them to create spacing between them and their enemies. And that's something that is vital if you're playing a glass cannon build that's still fairly confrontational. So it was cool to see what the developers were saying about supporting playstyle weaknesses come to light through grimoires like Vault, because now players will have access to a great mobility skill via the bow skill line. There was a cool Destro staff scribed ability that also had a long casting animation but affected a major area on the ground, which sounds like it has the potential to be very strong against large packs of trash mobs in dungeons or trials or big ass groups in Cyrodiil, if it's customized appropriately. What I also found interesting were some of the buffs and debuffs that we'll have access to, and for me, I think the ability to add these to our scribe skills is ultimately what will interest me the most about this new system. For example, as a pretty sweaty PvP support player, it intrigues me to know that I may have the possibility to give my allies minor heroism or inflict my enemies with major maim from using a scribe skill. Ultimately, the freedom that we have when it comes to customizing these new skills is pretty appealing to me. When I was playtesting Gold Road, I also took a look at a lot of the different styles that we'll be getting at launch. There were a lot of blue variants that I remember, such as a blue barrier variant and a blue vigor variant. There will be a red snipe variant, <laughs> perfect for all the Nightblade bow gankers in the chat, and many others. I hope that, much like the other systems that have been introduced to the game, we'll continue to see both the scribing and the styling system get expanded upon, with more cool customizable grimoires and more means to customize the appearance of our abilities. I didn't take a good look at the new mythic, but I did chat with my guildie, Mika, about them since she did happen to glance at them. One that interested me was a gauntlet mythic that, when worn, will mitigate an insane amount of damage every time you block, but only for a very short amount of time. The cooldown for this proc was also something like 5 seconds, but these values are subject to change. This interested me as someone that block casts her skills pretty often in PvP, and it also sounded like a great means to mitigate a lot of lethal damage if timed just right, such as when you get ult dumped by an opponent or several opponents. 
There was a necklace mythic that behaved very similarly to the set Daedric Trickery, if you're familiar with that one. While in combat, you'll gain a random major buff every X amount of seconds. Additionally, this mythic will give enemies within a certain range of you a random minor debuff that corresponds with whatever buff you happen to have from the mythic at the time. So if you're given the major berserk buff from this mythic, then enemies around you would be inflicted with minor maim. The last mythic that we discussed was some item that allows you to see guards or witnesses through walls or some shit like that. It was definitely a roleplay mythic for those interested in living out their criminal scum ambitions. I couldn't find my way to the Dawnwood biome, unfortunately, but the Gold Road and the Colovian Highlands both looked spectacular, and I had a great time exploring these areas and tackling the enemies that I ran into. I actually found a Miramore incursion spawner, but it was not active, so that tells me that this new world event will operate similarly to world events like Geysers or Harrowstorm where there are specific spawning locations whose icons get added to your map when you encounter them for the first time, but then only one of them will be active at a time, and the active one will also show up on your map by way of a pulsing cross swords icon. I like to return to aesthetically pleasing zones to capture b-roll for my videos, and I can already tell that I'll be spending a lot of time in this new zone because of how nice it looks. The furnishings also looked quite nice. They reminded me a lot of the Leowin ones that we got in Blackwood. Surprise, surprise. I also took a brief look at the motifs. Honestly, I wasn't too fond of the wood elf looking one. I think that Ephraise Will is still the most goaded Bosmer themed motif that the game has to offer. But one of the motifs looked kind of knight-like, which I know is going to make some people roll their eyes because they're sick of all the knight motifs that we got from High Isle, but if you know me, you know I can't get enough of that shit. Waiter, more knight motifs, please! But that'll conclude the segment about my time spent playtesting Gold Road. Let's move on to some thoughts that I had about what I experienced at these events. Alright, I know no one asked, but I'm going to share some of my thoughts about everything that I learned from attending this event anyways, and you can't stop me. <laughs> I'm actually going to share a sentiment that's fairly similar to one that I shared in the Necrom overview video that I made when I got the chance to playtest that a year ago, and that's that I found some of the new skills to not always synergize with the high APM playstyle that I prefer. Many of them had noteworthy cast times, meaning it wasn't always super feasible to cancel the animation for them. Not that that's a bad thing, mind you, but it's something that I took note of. Please don't kill me, casual players. I'm, I'm one of you too, okay? <laughs> As a stinky PvP sweat, I find ESO's fast-paced combat system very satisfying. I love bash weaving, bar swap cancelling, and block casting my animations to squeeze out as many actions per minute as I can, and doing so can provide quite the advantage in a reactive and punishing environment, such as the PvP ones that we have in the game. That's fun to me, but just as well, I know this playstyle is not for everyone. Some players prefer much slower paced combat as it's more comfortable or accessible for them. I mean, some players just want to take it easy when they play ESO too, you know? And that's totally cool. But as a player who gravitates towards a high APM playstyle, I'll likely pass on some of the scribe skills that are channeled because they're just not my cup of tea. Although I'm sure they will be for many others. That being said, what I really enjoyed about the scribing system was that it could be used as a means to supplement something that your class, build, or group lacks, such as more resource sustain, more crowd control options, or the presence of certain buffs and debuffs. I also really appreciate how the visuals of the scribe skills change per the different focuses that you choose to add to them. This notion, combined with the new styling system that will also come with Gold Road, will make it easier than it ever has been to live out your power fantasies. On the topic of power fantasies, the developers assured us that the new scribe skills will not diminish any of the existing class identities. For example, they wanted to ensure that something like easy access to stealth via a skill would be unique to Nightblades, and Sorks would be the only class that ever have those annoying ass pets. Okay, they didn't phrase it like that, but you know what I mean. Well, what they mean. What I mean about what they mean. It was nice to hear that this is something that they keep in mind throughout the development process. However, Something that I'm still a little worried about, and I know many others in the community are as well, is that we may end up observing something similar to what happened because of the implementation of hybridization a while back, where something that was meant to increase build diversity also ended up making every class's playstyle even more similar in the more endgame facets of ESO. For example, some scribed skill combinations had the potential to be incredibly strong, which could result in a lot of players utilizing the exact same scribed skill with the same combination of augments in their builds, like in PvP. 
This notion was brought up with the developers, and admittedly, I was a little confused by their answers, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> but my understanding of their responses was that the system was also meant to harmonize with the existing class identities, so that players would scribe skills that ultimately complements the playstyle of their class, instead of all building their skills the same way across every class. The class mastery scripts reinforce this concept by granting players access to different class passives by way of adding this augment to their scribed skill. I think this is something that we'll just have to wait to see how things play out. The PTS will be up soon enough and we'll be able to see what the verdict is sometime after. While we're still kind of on the topic of identity, which can be reinforced through visuals, I've noticed that we've been seeing more flashy effects through sets and cosmetics as of late, and I found this to be a welcome addition to the game. Those new Infinite Archive outfit styles produce particle effects when they're all worn together. Newer mythics and sets have flashy procs and animations, and now we'll be able to customize the visuals of some of our skills more to our liking. Heck, we can even summon our designated mount via a scribe skill. That's pretty sweet, dude. I do like how it feels like everything is coming together visually, and we'll be able to put together some amazing looks for our characters that extend beyond what motifs and style pages we use. Some of the rewards that I checked out were pretty spectacular as well. It really feels like the developers have considered a lot of the feedback that we've given them about earnable rewards. While the new trial will not reward us with a new skin, which is what many players have been coping for, I mean, uh, <coughs> hoping for, <coughs> the body markings that come from it are quite luminous. They kind of remind me of the Meridian Sunburst body markings, and they are bound to stand out when worn, which is what a lot of players prefer when it comes to trial rewards. I also saw a dope body marking that I believe is going to come from Infinite Archive, as it had a lot of Hermaeus Mora imagery, especially those iconic eyes. And that body marking was also quite colorful and intricate and saturated, and it took up a lot of space on my character's body. We'll be able to get a really unique skin that, if my memory serves me correctly, it looks like black marble or glass with shiny gold cracks all throughout it. Now this skin is obtained by completing the 10 year story achievement, which will require you to complete all of the faction, DLC, and chapter quests. Yeah, that's a lot of questing, but take my word for it. The skin looked pretty cool, and if you've been playing ESO for a while now, you may have already finished a lot of these quests, and you'll be handsomely rewarded for it with this excellent skin. If you're just getting into the game, no worries. ESO can be played in bite sizes, zones aren't gated by level, and you can enjoy the standalone stories, chapters, and quests at your own pace. Just like last year with Necrom, we'll also be able to obtain a mount upon attaining 100% completion in the new zone. A common critique that players have about the game is that earnable rewards often pale in comparison visually to the kinds of cosmetics that you can purchase with real money in the crown store. I found this to definitely be the case with mounts. However, I was pleasantly surprised to see that the earnable mounts that we'll be able to receive from getting 100% completion in the West Weald actually looks like it belongs in a crown crate season. It reminded me a lot of the Radiant Apex mounts from the Stone Lore crates. It had a lot of stylistic similarities with those mounts, and it was a cinch mount if I recall correctly. There were quite a few other little earnable rewards that could be obtained by completing achievements that I believe were mostly linked with quests, so I look forward to taking a closer look at those on the PTS. I always appreciate being able to attend events like these because I get the chance to peek behind the curtain, so to speak, and hear more about the development process of ESO, which I find very intriguing. Gold Road will be coming to the PTS very soon, and while I'll be a busy gal IRL, I'll try to bring you all some more Gold Road PTS goodness on this channel whenever I can. If you can, definitely hop on the PTS and test the content out for yourselves, and then share your feedback with the developers. Do recall that Gold Road will launch on June 3rd for Mac and PC, and the 18th for Xbox and PlayStation. Thank you so much for watching, thank you to my YouTube members for their support, and thank you to Bethesda for flying me out to this event so that I could make this content for my audience and experience it for myself. I would have never been able to experience anything that I did if it were not for them. Alright, see you in the next video, gamers. Cheers.